My name is Jacob Howenstein. I am an assistant professor at the University of Alabama in Huntsville, located in Huntsville, Alabama, USA. Today, I'm going to be presenting a method I have developed for compact storage of scrambled CD-ROM data. First, I'd like to give you an overview of what's included in this presentation. First, I'll talk about the motivation for this work, which ties into the digital data preservation and digital archival community, so I'll talk about some of the basics there. Then we'll get more into the background. We'll talk about the preservation and archival process. We'll talk about our focus in this work, which is CD-ROMs. So we'll talk about the technical details of CD-ROMs. We'll talk about reading data from CD-ROMs. And we'll get into the so-called scrambled data, alluded to in the title, and the value of that data. Then we'll get into how our method works to compact that scrambled data. And finally, we'll get into experiments and results and the conclusion. So for the motivation of this work, it ties into the observation that there's been an increased interest in archival and preservation of historical digital data, especially in recent years. And often the focus of this uh, preservation has been video games data, though if you go back and dig through the past few years of literature, you'll see it's not strictly limit limited to that. There's lots of discussion of archiving old computing data. Often archival and preservation is a community effort, that is, it's not spearheaded by a company with multiple millions, millions of dollars to spend on archiving and preserving this data. Instead, it's a community using commodity off-the-shelf hardware to so-called dump or image old media. That is to say, essentially extract the old media into a file, and then that, new, that file is preserved on modern media. So we go from media that's near the end of its life to having a copy of that media on some modern media that will hopefully last far into the future. And this storage, because we expect it to go far into the future to preserve the data, is often done with redundancy. As a result, the data storage requirements are large, and unfortunately, community resources are relatively limited. Getting a bit more into the details of preservation and archival, these dumping communities typically use a standard format for what we could call the final dumps that are produced. This standard format is chosen so that it enables easy comparison between members and between dumps made by an individual member. That is, we can verify essentially if a dump is correct, if two members dump the same disk, for example, for dumping CD-ROMs, we can compare the dumps and verify that they match. This standard format's also chosen so that it enables a high level of software compatibility. For example, if we want our disks to be compatible with emulators, we choose a format that enables that. And sometimes, though, there's not just a final dump that is produced. There may be some intermediate data that's produced during the dumping process that's in a non-standard format. This intermediate data typically does not have the high level of software compatibility, but is produced maybe because it's more it's closer to the native representation of the media, and then that intermediate data will be transformed into the final dump. One interesting thing that can happen as part of this conversion from the intermediate data to the final dump is that the intermediate data may contain extra data that does not make it into the final dump, and we'll look at an example of this later. And so as a result, from a preservation and archival standpoint, standpoint, intermediate data and the final dump both have value. The intermediate data potentially contains more data that isn't maybe present in the final dump, but it's non-standard and typically harder to work with than the final standard dump. The final dump, though, may exclude data that the intermediate data has, but it's worth keeping a copy of because it's in a standard format that's much easier to work with than the intermediate data. Our focus in this work is going to be on CD-ROM archival and preservation. And we'll see uh, for a little later in the presentation that we have an intermediate data format there called scrambled data. And the final dump is what's called unscrambled data. So before we can understand exactly what scrambled data is and why it may contain data that the unscrambled final dump doesn't, we need to talk a little bit about the technical details of compact disks. Really, our focus here is going to be on CD-ROMs, but some of what we'll talk about applies to generally compact disks. So compact disks are divided into sectors of 2,352 bytes. Originally, CDs were really only for audio, 16-bit, 44.1 kilohertz audio, 75 sectors gave you one second of audio. Later on, it was devised 
a way to store data on CDs, so-called CD-ROMs, this storing data splits the sectors into what are called fields. The first 12 bytes of each sector is, each data sector is what's called the sync field, which is actually just those specific 12 bytes there. Zero, FF, 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 so on, the last byte's zero. The remaining bytes of the sector then contain things like the address of the sector, the what's called mode of the sector, the error correction, and so on and so forth. We actually don't really need to know those details here, so we won't worry about them too much right now. One kind of unique issue that arises when storing data on CD-ROMs is regular bit patterns, that is long strings of say all zero bits or all one bits tend to be a bit problematic. Specifically, the decoding hardware on the optical drive often has trouble decoding that. This is a problem specifically with data because it's not uncommon to have long strings of zeros of ones in data compared to audio. So to avoid regular bit patterns, data sectors are what are called scrambled. This essentially is just a byte-wise XOR operation where each byte of the sector, excluding the sync field, that is the first 12 bytes of the sector, is scrambled against what is called a scrambling table. This scrambling table is just defined in various standards documents. So this scrambling avoids these regular bit patterns, and then we can simply descramble, unscramble these data sectors when we read them, and because XOR is easily reversible, we just XOR with the same scrambling table, we get our unscrambled data back. So we can see here graphically which uh, parts of the data sector are and are not scrambled. So those with a gray background are scrambled and those with a clear background, the sync, just the sync field, are not scrambled. A few other notes about CD-ROMs. Uh, so some disks intentionally violate the CD-ROM standards. Specifically, some copy protection schemes use invalid air correction or air detection data, uh, resulting in what are called air sectors. These basically are sectors that even when the optical drive is able to exactly read the bits from the sector, the sector will appear to be corrupt because the disk has been produced in a way such that the, the air correction and air detection data indicates the sector is invalid. Some disks also have both audio and data sectors. So there'll be a mix of audio sectors which are not scrambled and data sectors which are scrambled. To read a CD-ROM to preserve it, essentially you read a sector which the optical drive will return 2,352 bytes. As we've said, that's the size of a sector. And if we instruct the optical drive to read the sector in data mode, it will automatically unscramble the data it will perform air, air detection and correction using the air detection data and air correction data, and it will return then a air corrected sector starting with the very first part of the data sector, the, the sync that starts with zero FFFF, we talked about previously. In contrast, if we instruct the optical drive to read a sector in audio mode, it will not unscramble, it will not use error correction because audio sectors are not scrambled, they don't have EDC or ECC data, it will just return the sector. Interestingly though, it will return the sector offset somewhat from the true sector beginning. So this audio offset is actually a widely studied phenomenon in the archival community. In fact, different models of drive have different audio offsets. There's a big database out there of what the offset is from the true sector start for different models of, of uh, optical drives. And this offset may even vary from one disk to the next. So for example, if there are different pressings, that is different manufacturing runs of a disk, sometimes what's called the factory offset or the write offset may change. So even though the data matches, the data may be shifted by some number of bytes on the disk. These offsets can be troublesome for the archival community because um, if a disk has just audio, the offsets may not match between members. So we need to somehow correct the offsets so that we can compare disks. If the disk has both audio and data, the offsets, off, offsets are different between the two sector types because data sectors are not offset and audio sectors are. As a result, we may have to do manual correction to match different dumps between different members or different copies, different pressings of the same disks. And so one of the problems the community faced was 
they basically were saying to themselves, it would be great to avoid this offset problem. And that's where the reading of scrambled data comes in. So one way to avoid the offset problem is to use what are called scrambled reads. In scrambled reads, data sectors are read in audio mode, bypassing descrambling and error correction. Because essentially the drive says, oh, I guess this is an audio sector. I don't need to descramble it. I don't need to use EDC or ECC data. I'll just pass it on its way. Unfortunately, standard drive reading commands forbid this. You can't tell the drive to say, read a data sector in audio mode. It will say the sector is the wrong type. I'm not going to do that. It turns out, though, it is possible to actually do this, to read data sectors in audio mode using some non-standard read commands or some specific drive models, which essentially don't fully enforce the standard. So using these non-standard read commands on, on the drives that support them or using a drive model that supports doing scrambled reads, you can read data sectors in a scrambled way. And it turns out these scrambled reads give a lot of benefits for CD archival. It enables you to read both audio and data sectors with the same offset because you're, both, you're reading both as if they were audio sectors. And that avoids this need to do manually, manual correction of the sector offsets between the difference between audio and data sectors. It also bypasses the optical drive error correction because the op optical drive treats it as if it's an audio sector. And this allows easy imaging of some copper protected disks that have intentional error sectors. Unfortunately, it also introduces some more work and storage requirements. Specifically, scrambled data has to be processed into the final dump because this is intermediate data. We also need to store both the intermediate data and the final dumps, and both, it turns out, are equal in size, essentially 2,352 bytes times the number of sectors. So to produce a final dump from the scrambled data, we need to convert the data into the standard disk image format. And typically the way that format looks is it has all the data unscrambled and it has any sectors that have EDC or ECC errors, that is error sectors, it replaces with dummy sectors. Dummy sectors are sectors where all bytes of the sector except the sync and header field are replaced with the hex sequence OX55. So in order to build the final dump from the intermediate or scrambled data, you have to unscramble all the data sectors with that XOR process we talked about previously and check each sector to see if it's an error sector. If the sector is an error sector, it will be replaced with a dummy sector. An obvious question you may have is, why are we using these dummy sectors? Well, it turns out, uh, for years and years, the community was doing archival with software that didn't deal with scrambled reads. And the way that software worked is it replaced error sectors with dummy sectors. So by continuing to do this, we maintain compatibility with existing software and we make sure that existing dumps match new dumps made with these scrambled mode reads. And it also makes it easy to match dumps between community members because Error sectors are intentionally erroneous and hard for the optical drive to read. Error sector contents may vary between disks and, and drives and reads and community members and so forth. So if we toss out that data, it makes it so we can match the dumps. And also, it was assumed that error, error sectors just really don't contain any real data. So there was no harm in replacing them with dummy sectors. Unfortunately, later on, it was learned that some error sectors do actually contain real data. So it turns out it's actually important to store intermediate, that is the scrambled data, and the final dump. Unfortunately, this makes our storage requirements even more burdensome. So as an example of data that is stored in an error sector, we've got here a snippet of a sector from the PC game Rune. At the top is the original scrambled data that we received from the optical drive. Uh, so that's in figure A. In figure B, we see the unscrambled but not error checked data. And we can see there, there's actually a snippet from a Lewis Carroll poem. So there is real data in that sector. But because that's an error sector, if we look at that same sector in the final dump, which we see in figure C, that data is now gone, replaced with all bytes of hex 5.5. 5. 
So as a quick recap of what we've, what we've discussed so far, CD-ROMs are often read in scramble mode to avoid that offset problem and bypass the drive error correction. That scramble data is then processed into the final dump, which consists of, the processing consists of unscrambling the data and replacing air sectors with dummy sectors. But both the scrambled data and the final dump are valuable for preservation. The final data is valuable because it's easy to inspect, has high software compatibility, enables easy comparison between uh, community members, and so on and so forth. But the scrambled data contains more data. It may contain data that's not present in the final dump, but it's not nearly as compatible or we could say useful on a daily basis. Thus, long term, there's a need to preserve and store both the final and unscrambled, or final and scrambled data. This essentially doubles our storage requirements. Now we finally have enough background, we can talk about our method. Our method works to compactly represent the intermediate data alongside the unscrambled final dump, thus making it so the storage requirements are less strenuous. The final dump, when our method is used, is completely unmodified. So that is, the final dump is just as useful as it ever was. It's completely unchanged. The only thing that's changed is the way the intermediate data is represented. The key observation in our method is that most sectors can be re-scrambled from the final dump. That is, the scrambling process is reversible. It's just an XOR. Specifically, any sector that does not have any errors can be exactly reconstructed by just re-scrambling it from the final dump. Thus, to store the scrambled data, we actually only need to store data for air sectors. Those are the only sectors that can't be exactly reconstructed from the final dump. Another key observation is that most sectors on most disks do not have errors. So if we can store the scrambled data only for air sectors, that means we can store the scrambled data for a relatively small number of sectors and achieve the space savings. So to create this compact representation for the scrambled data, our method works in two phases. The first phase creates an approximate reconstruction that we call epsilon hat of the intermediate data from the final dump, which will denote omega. And then the second phase encodes the differences between the actual intermediate data, which is epsilon, and epsilon hat, that is the approximate intermediate data, using the x delta 3 binary diff uh, software. So phase one basically boils down to iterate over each 2,352 byte sector in omega, that is the final dump. If the first 12 bytes of the sector equal the sync field, re-scramble the remaining 2,340 bytes of the sector. Remember, the first 12 bytes of a data sector are not scrambled. Cos copy the sector into epsilon hat. It says possibly re-scramble because if the first 12 bytes of the sector are not the sync field, we assume it's a data sector and we just copy it directly from omega into epsilon hat. Phase two of our method then uses X delta three, the binary diff software, to just encode the differences between epsilon hat and epsilon, giving us our compact representation delta. So delta essentially encodes all the changes all the differences, I should say, between epsilon hat, which is our approximate reconstruction of epsilon from the final dump, and epsilon, the actual scrambled data that we originally received from the optical drive. So in pseudocode, our method looks something like this. To create delta, that is the compact representation of the scrambled data from omega, the final dump, via epsilon hat, which is the approximately reconstructed scrambled data, we need uh, one piece of data, which is the scrambled ta table. Our input to our method is epsilon, the original scrambled data, and omega. The output of our method is the approximate reconstruction of the scrambled data, epsilon hat, and delta, the uh, compact representation of epsilon. And essentially what the code does, you can see there, is for each sector in omega, check to see if the first 12 bytes are the uh, sync field. If it is, we XOR with the table to uh, re-scramble that sector, and then we copy it into 
epsilon hat. If the sync field is not present, we just directly copy the sector into epsilon hat because that means it's a data sector. It doesn't need to be re-scrambled. Once epsilon hat is produced, delta is actually just the, or the delta that is our compact representation is actually just the output of that x delta 3 command uh, you see right there. So essentially, the idea is epsilon hat and epsilon differ in probably very few byte positions, and so delta typically rep ends up being a very compact representation of the scrambled data. To recreate the intermediate data from the compact representation, our method again works in two phases. It creates the approximate reconstruction epsilon hat of the intermediate data from the final dump, and it applies delta to epsilon hat. The output of applying delta to epsilon hat is the original scrambled data, epsilon. So phase one is actually identical here to phase one for the process of creating the compact representation. We iterate over each sector, we re-scramble it if necessary, ending up with epsilon hat. Phase two of recreating the intermediate data just consists of using x delta three to apply delta to epsilon hat. The output of that then is our original scrambled data, epsilon. In pseudocode, our method for recreating epsilon from omega using delta looks like this. So again, we make use of the scrambled, da uh, scrambled table, bold t. The input to our method is epsilon, or sorry, is omega and delta. The output is epsilon hat and epsilon. So essentially, you'll see that the, the for each block right there is actually identical to the previous block of pseudocode we saw because that's just creating epsilon hat. The key change between uh, constructing delta and applying delta is just in that last line where now our output is epsilon, which is achieved by that application of x delta 3 shown down there, where we apply delta to the constructed epsilon hat, outputting the original epsilon. To evaluate the space savings of our method, we compared file sizes of seven zipped compressed versions of intermediate data and our delta representations of the same intermediate data. And we computed what's called the space savings, which here we represent with k, for each of these. So k is computed as one minus the new size over the original size. So basically that's saying that if there is no compression, no space savings, new size is equal to original size and k is equal to zero. In contrast, if new size is less than the original size, k is some number greater than zero. Potentially, if the new size is, is zero bytes, k is equal to one. So for our experiments, we did this comparison for four CD-ROM disks, and we tried to choose a set of disks that represent a variety of potential inputs to our method. So D1 consists of data sectors only and no air sectors. D2 consists of both data sectors and audio sectors and no air sectors. D3 and D4 both contain data sectors only, and both of those disks contain some sectors with airs. That is, sectors that would be replaced in the final dump with those dummy sectors. So in this table, we can see our results. We have a column, sorry, a row for each disk, D1, D2, D3, and D4. First, you see there the original size of each disk, each disk, and the original sizes range from around 500 megs up through 830 megs. So that means that both the scrambled data and the final dump would be that size because both the final dump and the scrambled uh, intermediate data contain each sector on the disk. So that size would apply to both the final dump and the scrambled data. Next, you see the number of air sectors present on each disk. So as I mentioned previously, disk one and disk two contain no air sectors, so that's zero. And you can see disk three and disk four contain around 585, 583 air sectors each. Next, you can see the size of the seven zip compressed version of the intermediate data. So you can see some space savings was achieved there. Next, you can see the size of the delta the, the compact representation of the intermediate data produced by our method. And you can see that 
we achieve typically a much higher level of space savings. Looking at the next column, the space savings with 7-zip ranged from about 0.003 at the worst to about 0.228 at the best or highest level of space savings, I should say. Our method at the lowest level of space savings produces space savings of 0.998 and at the highest level produced the space savings of 0.999. So our method typically produced much, much more compact representations than just a traditional data compression done by 7-zip. So as a specific example, if you look at disk one there, the 7-zip representation is about 460 megabytes. Our, our method was around 2,000 bytes. So again, summarizing the results, in these experiments, our method achieves much higher K, much higher space savings, and it did perform best for disks with no air sectors, which shouldn't be too surprising because any sector without an air can be exactly reconstructed in its scrambled form from omega, so we should have a very small representation when we can just reconstruct it from omega. But our method still is really good for disks with air sectors. So the key thing, though, with our method is we reconstruct the scrambled data from the final dump. So you keep the original final dump and you store this delta alongside it and you get this nice compact representation of delta that in our experiments was much smaller than just compressing the intermediate scrambled data with a traditional compression algorithm. So in conclusion, what we've seen is for preservation purposes, CD-ROMs are often read in scrambled mode because scrambled mode bypasses the optical drive error correction. It ensures the same offset for audio and data sectors. The scrambled intermediate data is then converted for the final dump where these sectors are unscrambled and any sectors with errors are replaced with dummy sectors. It's important to preserve both the intermediate and the final data because the intermediate may have more data in it that is stripped out, replaced with dummy sectors in the final dump. But it's still valuable to store the final dump because they are much more compatible with software and typically just much more useful on a daily basis. They're compatible with your disk imaging software and all kinds of stuff like that. Our method, though, allows compact storage of the intermediate data. All you have to do is store delta alongside that final dump and we saw a much better space savings compared to standard file compression. Okay, so that is my presentation on uh, compactly storing scrambled data. Are there any questions for me?